Hello, everyone. It's wonderful to be here with you. Uh, I did these workshops, uh, I guess it was a week and a bit ago, and had a great group, and I'm excited. I hope you're also excited and strapped in for this three-hour extravaganza we're going to have together. Um, so I love doing these workshops, and I'm really thrilled to have a chance to do it for people in the Philippines. You obviously have very important elections coming up very soon. If the tools and techniques and approaches that I go through today prove useful for you uh, in helping, you know, root out manipulation, whether it's, you know, websites, social media ads, all that stuff, that will be a, a really great thing. So uh, let me share my screen and, uh, and then we'll be able to sort of talk a little bit about uh, what the plan is for today. Uh, it is, so just so you know, it is night my time. It's about 8 p.m. Uh, on Friday night, and hopefully you can see my screen here. If, um, if the slides are not up right now, maybe somebody could just let me know. Otherwise, hopefully we're good. Um, and so, uh, so our first section here, we're gonna do two. First, as you heard, investigating websites. Second, investigating digital ads. And they really connect well together. Uh, we're gonna use some examples of websites in the Philippines and we're gonna to continue to work and use those as examples all the way through. And so hopefully you find it relevant and useful. Uh, I believe you all received a message asking you to sign up for some free accounts and also in install some Chrome browser plugins. You'll always have them as a resource. Uh, and so you can come back to them and I will keep saying this throughout the next few hours, which is uh, I'm gonna throw a lot of stuff at you uh, maybe some of it you already know, maybe, maybe some of it's new, maybe all of it's new. Uh, and if it seems overwhelming, we are going to take breaks and you're going to be able to ask questions. So number one, but number two, the best thing that you could do is make sure that you come back to this material within the next week. So, you know, book some time off, book a half an hour off, uh, on your schedule in the next few days and just sit down and flip through these slides and the slides in the next presentation, um, as well. And that will really help the stuff sink in, okay? So that's that's the sort of life hack I wanna give you. All right, these are the things that you should have installed because I would love for you to follow along with me as we do these things. This is the link to today's slides. Um, please open that up, bookmark it, make sure you have it. All right, two other resources here that I just wanna mention. Uh, you know, on the left, this is a completely free online book. Uh, I get to edit it. It basically just means I get to choose some of, you know, the best journalists and researchers around the world to write chapters and case studies about doing these kinds of investigations. Uh, and we did actually have a case study written by, I think it was Gemma at Rappler. So we do have a case study from the Philippines. Uh, so I encourage you to read the handbook. And on the right-hand side, this is a Google Doc uh, that I put tools, some essential tools and extensions in. Some of them we're gonna cover today, but there's some others we are. And so if you're really interested in this stuff and you wanna go deeper, if you, you, know, if you really wanna advance your knowledge, read the handbook. And then, you know, bookmark and play around with some of these tools and you will be far ahead of so many other people. Um, by the way, I don't think you can see it on my camera, but my cat Rosie um, has made an appearance. Uh, I don't I'll just point towards my desk here. There we go, in case you can see my camera. Um, she will probably jump on me and hit my keyboard many times during the course of this presentation. So if something goes wrong and you hear a cat meowing, um, that's, that's probably Rosie. Hopefully she's gonna be gentle with me. All right, so what are we gonna do? What is the plan here for the next well, less than 90 minutes now. Um, so I'm gonna talk a, a little bit about fundamentals for digital investigative work, things that apply, regardless of whether we're talking about websites, ads, social media, et cetera. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about, you know, a content analysis of websites, uh, which is a fancy way of saying, you know, when we're interested in a website for reporting and investigative purposes, what, what kind of reading and what kind of things do we pay attention to on it? We're gonna talk about who is and IP searches, which can potentially help you find a person behind a website and potentially also help you find additional connected websites. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the Wayback Machine, which is a fantastic web archiving service with an amazing browser plugin, which actually was just updated like um, a few days ago, I think. Uh, and so uh, one of my slides in here is outdated, so I'm going to just show you live what it looks like now. It's just fantastically useful. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about analyzing social engagement. So you're interested in a website. How do we find out how popular it is on Facebook and elsewhere? Uh, analyzing the audience of a website in terms of its traffic. 
And then the last thing is, continuing with the theme we will start with uh, who is and IP searches, is we're going to talk about a way to kind of sneakily connect websites together that the owners of the websites may not realize you can do to figure out that websites are actually connected. Because people may do their best to kind of not declare which websites they own. They may not clearly show that they are running a bunch of sites. They may be trying to conceal things. This may be able to help you kind of unravel that mystery. And we'll have a bit of time for questions and comments. And then obviously we'll have a bit of a break uh, between starting uh, the ads one so everybody can chill for a minute and I can you know, stop talking just for a few minutes at least. And that's, that's the plan, then we'll dive into digital ads. All right, um, so let's talk about these fundamentals here. Uh, you know, one of the, the things that you, you've got to do in a digital investigation is, you know, you've got to think about what are the core things you want to focus on. And so what I would suggest, um, this is the, the a, ABC model, which is actors behavior content. So actors, you know, uh, who are the people behind the accounts, behind the websites, behind things, uh, who are the key folks involved? Behavior. What kind of content is being shared? What kind of content is being published? What kind of you know ads are being bought? And uh, you know, and how are accounts interacting with this content? Uh, and so the you know behavior and content really intersect a lot. Behavior being sort of you know how things are being shared, uh, how people are interacting with each other in the digital environment, and content is often you know a key thing that they use to interact with each other in terms of sharing links in terms of publishing things. Um, one of the things that is really important to doing this work, and you still got a, you know, a bit of time before uh, election day, before things get really super crazy, I realize you know, there's already stuff going on, but you should, if you have not already been, but you should start now collecting Facebook pages, groups, websites, accounts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Things that you wanna be paying attention to and monitoring over time, because that's how you spot trends. That's how you spot patterns. That's how you know that you should be digging deeper into something. It's hard to just kind of parachute in and be like, okay, I'm going to find something interesting about the election. You should be, you know, building Twitter lists of Twitter accounts. Uh, if you have access to CrowdTangle or Facebook, um, you could be watching multiple pages and multiple groups using that, or simply just making lists and spreadsheets and visiting them regularly really important um, and as you see things you're interested in who is sharing it uh, is it being shared across pages do those pages seem to have connective tissue between them and oftentimes you know we're starting with one piece of content one article one post that interests us and we try to see like well who shared it and what else do they share and are do they also run a website with one piece of content one piece of activity we can often blow out an entire network um, and we need to think of the, doing this in a cross-platform basis. Obviously, Facebook, super important, widely used in the Philippines, but it's not the only platform there, even though it might be a dominant one. Uh, so we need to think about being cross-platform and thorough in that respect. Uh, and that also uh, is relevant for languages. And then the last two points here are, are kind of two of the most important ones. So attribution is hard. You need strong evidence. What I'm talking about there is when you're gonna point the finger, basically, when you are going to say, you know, this website and these Facebook pages are all, you know, run by this PR firm or run by this candidate. If you are going to do that, you need to have good, strong evidence. And we're gonna talk about the types of digital evidence that we can start to build on, where we get to the point, pardon me, where we might feel confident about pointing the finger. Um, but you need to be very cautious about this and diligent about it. And then the second thing is that, you know, of all the tools and the techniques and the approaches and things like that that I'm going to show you tonight, um, you know, they, they don't replace building sources, talking to people, all those core things that, that we do as part of our reporting. Uh, they work wonderfully in concert together. Um, and it is a much stronger story if you have, you know, these digital approaches along with traditional approaches. That is when you get really good stuff. And the last thing I want to emphasize here is that we're going to, sh we're going to go through a lot of tools. We're gonna talk about ways of using the tools, but I gotta tell you the most important one, and it's kind of a cliche, is absolutely your brain. If you can't think about when and where to apply these tools, if you can't you know, start to see how to look at websites and ads and with the investigative mindset, uh, then, then this stuff isn't really useful. You have to figure out how to apply it and you have to have the right mindset as you go through it. And we're gonna talk about that throughout tonight. Okay. 
So why don't we dive into uh, investigating websites and starting with our, our first piece of, piece of that content analysis, which you know I said was sort of a fancy way. In this case, it's, it's a fancy term for just, you know, how, do we, how would we read a website? If we are interested in a website from an investigative and reporting perspective, what are the things we wanna pay attention to? So I've got a list of things here for you, and I, I don't need to sort of read them all off to you. You can see them there. But you know, the, 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 the headline, the takeaway on this is that we are not passive consumers of a website when we have this investigative mindset. We want to be thorough, we want to be comprehensive, and we want to pay attention for what, what is there and also what is not there. So what do I mean by that? Well, one of the things that is often on a website is an about page, right? It says, you know, about this website, maybe who runs it, maybe, you know, when it was founded, uh, a company involved, the people involved. And so that is a really helpful place, obviously, if we're interested in a website. But if a website doesn't have an about page, you know, that can also be notable. Um, is a website not telling you anything about the people running it, the entities, why it exists? And is that something you need to know? So things that are there, things that aren't there, often uh, equally as important. Uh, click on the links, visit all the pages you can, scroll through, be really thorough about it. Um, pay attention to things like privacy policies and terms and conditions pages. These, you know, you may look through a website and it doesn't list a company name or an address or a phone number anywhere. And then all of a sudden you pull up the privacy policy and boom, they've actually got that information because it's often required by law. And so, you know, those seemingly small and unimportant links at the bottom of a website, privacy policy, terms and conditions, disclosures, always, always look at those, always visit those. Uh, if it is uh, publishing content, do they have, you know, author names? Are those real people? Do they have, uh, you know, author pages with photos that we can look at more deeply? Uh, is the website linking to social media accounts, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, other places? Uh, then obviously the website itself is declaring a link to those things and it's worth going and looking at those. And if this is a scenario where there are, you know, products on a site, uh, always look for reviews and ratings on the site and off of it. Because, uh, you know, if it, there's a scam or something shady going on, chances are upset customers will actually say something about that. So again, the mindset matters. How we think about gathering information, paying attention to what is there and also what isn't there, really, really important. All right, so let's, let's do our first kind of live demo here. Okay, so, so what do we see here? Well, one of the first things that I take note of is, is we've got a bunch of menus, right? We, and they've got an About Us page, submit a news article, advertise with us, contact us. Okay, so from the first few seconds of visiting this website, we already know two things that are kind of useful. So number one, we know that anyone apparently can submit a news article to be on the website. So that's something we're gonna keep in mind as we you know, read the news articles, knowing that they can just be submitted perhaps by anyone. Number two, advertise with us. So we know that they are you know, accepting money for advertising, that there's you know, here where my mouse is, you know, they've got a space on the page saying, hey, advertise with us. So they're clearly taking direct money, which we will talk about more in our ads section, where people can directly buy an ad. Um, and, you know, as, as we sort of look down here, we also see that they're telling us, you know, what they're focused on. Number one, most engaged information website for Filipino, Canadian in Canada. I thought this would be a relevant website, given that I'm based in Canada. You're in the Philippines. We are coming together and bridging the divide here on, on this website. So as we scroll through it, you know, we can see here, uh, you know, they've got this mix. They've got news from the Philippines. They've got news from Canada. Um, and you know, we can just sort of click on one of these and start to look at it. Uh, and what we see here, one of the things that stands out to me right away is, you know, this, this first paragraph here, um, and I can't actually, it doesn't allow me, see they, they have a, alert content is protected. If I try to double click on it, that little warning pops up. So I can't highlight the first paragraph. But one of the things that I can see here is, you know, they've got the description of the photo, a person wearing a mask crosses the street in Toronto on March 2nd. Um, and then at the end of it, it says, Evan Mitsui, CBC. So this is a photo from the CBC, our, our public broadcaster in Canada. Um, I don't think Maharlika News would have the copyright to be able to publish that. And as we sort of scroll down the whole story here, they've got a photo from the Canadian press, which they would need to be a member of to use that photo. 
And if we scroll down here at the very bottom of the article, it says credit belongs to www.cbc.ca. So they have clearly copied and pasted an entire article from the CBC, which they are not allowed to do. And, and of course, the hilarious thing about this is if I were to try and copy and paste this article, I get an alert saying content is protected, even though it's not even their content. So right away, we can see here that um, they are committing copyright infringement. And if we visited more articles, we would see that this is pretty much a consistent thing that's happening. They seem to be automatically grabbing articles from the CBC. And that, of course, would make us wonder, well, where are the articles about the Philippines coming from? Um, and so, you know, if we look at this, we see it's a full article and we can see it's, in this case, it's coming from a government website, um, pna.gov.ph. Um, and, uh, and so in this case, you know, they're taking it from there and it would be interesting to see the other sources that they're taking from. Um, so right away, we're sort of like, huh, they're taking ads and yet they're also taking other people's content perhaps without permission. Uh, we would obviously want to scroll down to the bottom and we can see here, advertise, submit an article, contact us, it's the same, and they have a disclaimer. So we would want to click on that um, and read through this. Uh, and the thing that I take note of here is that at the very bottom it says press releases slash press statements. Uh, press releases are posted verbatim and are labeled as such. So they are clearly not reading what is submitted and they are happy to put it out clearly. So, you know, that's something to take into account. Last thing I want to note as we're visiting this site, you know, I would visit every single page. We're not going to do that this time. But I think one of the things that would be easy to miss, and this is why I really emphasize clicking as much as possible, is this part over here. It says Filipino Business Directory. Join today. Um, and you can click on this. And what it does is it actually takes us to an entirely new website within Maharlika News. Okay? Uh, and we can see here it's got these listings of businesses. It's got a different template. Um, this is a whole other part of the website. And on this one, we see, you know, we've got an email address, we've got some pricing information. So it's super easy to have missed this and to not have seen this whole part of their business model if we hadn't clicked on this little link right here. Okay, so that's just, again, wanting to emphasize that you want to be thorough, you want to leave nothing unclicked um, as much as possible, and to be diligent about doing that. Okay, so that's a, a quick little visit of a website. Let's go back to our, uh, our slides here. And uh, so we visited that. Now, what if, you know, after we visit a website and we have looked at it and we've looked at what is on their website, what's another thing that would be helpful to do right away in terms of content analysis? Well, one of the things that I would suggest is to see what other people have to say about this website, right? Like there's, there's what they want to put on their website, what they want to say about themselves, but also there's the question of how are other people talking about this website and this business? And so there's really easy ways of doing that. And the one I've put here is to like drop into your favorite search engine, uh, Maharlika News, but to put the name of it in quotes. Because if you do that, then, you know, it's not going to load the website for you. It's going to, Google is going to say, all right, here is what people are saying about this website. And here are how many pages Google has ever indexed, you know, seen from this website. Um, so we can see we get a lot of results here, and a lot of them are coming from its own domain name, which is fine. But, you know, we always want to just, we want to go beyond the first page of Google. Please, whatever you're doing, don't just stay on the first page of Google results. So here's the one that stood out to me when I did this search was there's a Wikipedia page called Fake News in the Philippines. We click on that. We scroll down to the M's and we can see that there is a listing for it, although there's not much information. Here it is, see? Um, but there is a footnote which takes us to an article which was published in 2017, um, which talks about an article that had been posted on this website that is being described as fake news. And so now we're starting to get a sense of, okay, so what, you know, what, what other people might be saying about this particular website. And it's as simple as just popping uh, the website in quotes into, uh, into Google. And the other thing that I would just suggest is you can also pull up Twitter or you can go to Facebook um, and you can go to the search bar. Uh, and we can, we can drop that in as well. Uh, and see, you know, what people are sharing about it. And, you know, Twitter defaults to top. You want to hit latest for the most recent. So we can see, you know, who is sharing stuff from this website and start to see if there might be patterns around that. We will come back to social sharing patterns on websites uh, soon. But just wanted to note that that's one way that you can look into that and, and look at that more closely.
Okay, so we looked at what's on the website. We looked at what other people might be saying about the website. Um, now let's see if we can maybe figure out who's behind the website. Uh, because on the about page and stuff like that, they're not really giving people's names. They're not really giving company names, right? And so if we want to figure that out, this is where the first kind of tool that I want to show you um, is what's called a who is search, okay? So here's the, here's the background on what this is. Um, every time somebody buys a domain name, in this case, Maharlika, Maharlika News, uh, you know, the information and the purchase of that domain name goes into a sort of universal database, uh, a domain registrar database. And what's recorded is, you know, the date that the domain name was purchased. And usually the information of the person or entity that purchased it, a name, a phone number, an address, a company name, those kinds of things, okay? And so there is a universal database that we can search, and I'm gonna show you two tools with good free services to do this. And sometimes you can get lucky and actually, you know, look up a domain name and see who owns it. Now, here's the caveat. Um, you often will not get a name. And the reason is that anyone who owns a domain name can spend a few extra dollars and have their information uh, remain private, okay? So like when I buy a domain name, I could spend an extra whatever, nine or 10 bucks. And instead of you seeing the name Craig Silverman showing up in the Whois record, and I'll show you what those look like in a second, it would say something like, you know, privacy protect or domain privacy. It would have some kind of a service that is a domain privacy service, okay? So this is what we wanna do here. We wanna take Maharlika News as our example, and we're gonna do searches, who is searches in two different tools. One is domainbigdata.com and the other is whoisology.com. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna do this. I'm gonna open up whoisology. Um, and so here's what it's saying. It's saying, okay, you wanna look for a domain name? Just drop the domain name in here. Okay, whoisology, let's do that. So we put maharlikanews.com, we hit search whoisology, and here's what the results page looks like. Okay, so you're gonna see a bunch of different information. The one that you know, we're really hoping to give us something here is this one, admin contact. So who is the administrator, the owner of this domain name? And unfortunately, we kind of strike out. All right, it says, if you see here, registration private under name. So that's what I said, people can pay for privacy. And when they do that, you tend to see something like this, registration private, you know, domains by proxy. Um, there's no one's name, there's no company name other than one that actually provides the service. And so we have struck out uh, in that respect. But there's always one piece of information that a Whois search will give you. You will always get this. And that is uh, the date of creation, the date that this domain name was most recently purchased. You know, there can be multiple owners of a domain name over time. Maybe I buy a domain name and five years later decide I don't need it anymore, so I stop paying. Somebody else can then buy it. And so what you get here in the create created date, which I'm highlighting, is the date of the most recent purchase, you know, meaning you know, the current owner has owned it since then. And in this case, we see that it was purchased um, in February 11th of 2016. Okay, so now we know when this domain name was purchased. Even though we don't get a name, we struck out, oh, that's terrible, there, nothing. Uh, we still at least know that this was bought in early 2016. And so this is why, we are trying more than one service, right? And this is a fundamental thing to doing digital investigative work. You have to try multiple approaches. You have to try multiple tools. Uh, you have to be willing to be creative in the way you're thinking about it because you may strike out five times, but the sixth time you try something different, boom, you actually get the answer you're looking for. All right, so now we're taking a look in domain big data, another tool that has a free level that gives good information. Let's search our domain name. And here's what we go. So, you know, the layout's a bit different, it's a different service. So what do we see here up top? Well, we see that same thing, uh, you know, date of purchase, uh, February 12th. Although actually it's a little bit different, isn't it? This one said February 11th. This one said February 12th. Why is that? Uh, the answer is that you'll always see it within, uh, you know, 24 hours. And the reason is that, you know, they're showing the, uh, they're calculating the date based on different time zones. Um, so I don't know which one which is using, but that's why you may see, uh, you know, a discrepancy of one day in different Whois records uh, because it depends on which time zone they're actually calculating the moment of purchase. In this case, you know, they say it's February 11th. In this case, they say it's February 12th. Okay. So again, we're seeing it's uh, registration private, oh, striking out. Here's what's kind of interesting as we 
uh, scroll down for domain big data. So they are giving us, this is the current registrant information up here, private domains by proxy, but they're telling us a historic registrant, okay? So this is where these services can be super helpful. Um, they are taking snapshots of the ownership information of, of like millions and millions and millions of domains, like literally every day or, at, you know, at an interval of a few hours. And so even if the registration is private today, it's possible that at some point in time earlier between 2016 and now when it was purchased, maybe they didn't actually pay for privacy. Maybe they were, you know, didn't feel the need to do that. And so when we get historic registrant information, in this case, it's telling us that back in 2017, January 30th of 2017, it was also private. Okay, so we struck out there, but this is where you can get lucky sometimes. Maybe it took a snapshot on the day or within a few days of it being first purchased, and maybe the person hadn't paid for privacy yet. So let's keep scrolling. Ah, and this is where we get lucky. Um, so you can see here, this is a registration snapshot from February 13th, 2016. So according to this, you know, within 24 hours or so of the domain first being purchased, and we get a name. Mark, a Mark Roll a Wobble. I'm probably absolutely butchering that. I'm so sorry. Um, Creative Mark Interactive. So we have managed, we struck out with Whoisology, right? All private. Goodbye, Whoisology. You're dead to us now. Uh, but we actually hit it with Domain Big Data because Domain Big Data for free is showing us its record from back in 2016. There's a guy's name, there's a company name. But it's not just that. Okay, so that's really good, right? We could start searching him and the company and be like, okay, what are they all about? But here's what's what's really great is it's telling us that you know there are a total of nine domains associated with Creative Mark Interactive. So it's telling us that in Domain Big Data's database of all of the you know domain ownership records, um, they see eight other domain names that have it currently or in the past been owned by Creative Mark Interactive, and they see seven for his name. So let's take the higher number. We can click on Creative Mark Interactive, and here is the list of domain names. So we see the one that we already knew about, Marhalika News, but look at these other ones here. There's um, there's another news site, apparently. There's creativemark.net. Maybe that's a company website. There's a construction thing, a wellness thing. Just even by scanning these, we can see maybe the other types of business. And here's a doctor. Um, and so now we have gone from one website where the website itself didn't tell us who owned it, doing a couple of who is searches. We now have a lead on the person in the company who, who perhaps still owns this domain name. And we also have a lead on a bunch of other websites of theirs um, that we could look at and start to figure out more information. And we also see here the dates of when these were purchased. So the most recent ones, it looks like, uh, is Golden Trillium uh, from 2017. So that's how we start with one, remember, one piece of content, one website, and we start to build it out. Uh, so that's the first part of who is. I want to show you one more thing about it. Remember, we want to look at historic registrants. If it's private, we want to see if we get any other linkages, and then we want to copy all those websites down and start investigating them. But at the very top here, there's one other thing that I want to show you. All right, so remember, we have the domain, we have the date of creation, date of purchase. Cool, they've owned it for six years. There's something here called IP address. All right, maybe some of you are familiar with this. Uh, to, to give a as non-technical a description as possible, every website, you know, they have, there's images, there's text that has to be stored somewhere. You know, the, all those files, all those images, they have to be hosted on a computer, a server somewhere so that when people say, Hey, I want to go to maralikanews.com and they type it into Google, Google knows where to go to grab all the information to show it in our web browser. Okay. So every, every website is physically hosted on a server somewhere in the world. And in order for people to be able to find that website, it has to have an address. It's just like sending a letter, you need to know the person's address. Well, to pull up a website, you need to know its IP address. And that IP address is the location on the internet of the server where the website is hosted, okay? And so there is actually a server somewhere with that, it looks like in Canada, here in Toronto where I am, uh, where the all the files for this website are hosted. And just like we can click on a company name when there's multiple uh, domains list linked to that company, we can also click on IP address, okay? So let's see what we get here. Uh, and we scroll down, ah, okay. 
this is helpful because according to this, it's seeing only two websites hosted on this IP. And here's the rule that you want to know. This is the most important thing about when you're doing a, an IP search like this is the fewer the number of websites hosted on an IP, the more likely they are to be connected. The fewer the number of websites, the more likely we are to care about it because they may be connected. Okay. Um, and, and the reason for this is, you know, when you pay to have your website hosted somewhere, uh, unless you specifically say, you know, I want to buy a server and, you know, host it and, and all that, which costs a lot more money. Um, the, the hosting companies may just randomly assign websites onto servers. So you may end up clicking on an IP address and seeing hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of websites all hosted on the same IP. In that case, they've just randomly been assigned together. There's no connection between them. But when the number is low, when it's two, when it's five, 10, 15, you know, that has a greater chance of there being a connection. And so at that point, then you want to start looking in, at those websites at their WHOIS records and seeing, hey, is there a connection or do they just happen to be hosted on the same server? In this case, you know, this first other domain name here is familiar to me because I know it was on the list of other domains that Creative Mark International uh, has registered. And so now we've got two points of connection. We have um, who is information that they have been registered by the same company. And we see that they are hosted on the same server also in Toronto. So those are two points of connection suggesting that these two websites um, are linked together. Okay. And that's how we start stacking things till we get to the point where we're ready to point the finger. Um, and so that's what you want to be able to start doing and gathering. Now, if you, uh, you know, are worried you're not going to remember everything I went through, I have a step-by-step -step walkthrough of everything we just did, right? We looked on Whoisology, then we went to Domain Big Data, we were interested in the historical records, um, we see the company, we see, we see also the IP address, and we get information there. Okay, so that's all in the slides, and you can walk through that again on your own. Just to note, you know, there are other services out there that can also tell you how many sites are hosted on an IP address. This is just a link to another one. And what's neat about it is it gives you kind of the historical perspective of how many uh, domains have been hosted on that particular IP address. Uh, and so, you know, in this case, it looks like there's always been just one or two on it, which means, um, again, it seems like it might be a server that, you know, that is being dedicated to a particular company's websites. And that's something that's worth looking into a bit more. Okay. Let me take a, a pause here for a moment. Let me just dive into um, uh, the chat and let me just see. Okay, great. We've got some, some comments here. Um, right. Uh, okay, so looks like when Maria went to visit the site, um, she maybe had an ad blocker or some kind of a antivirus, which decided that, um, uh, you know, that this site was not a safe one to visit. Uh, if you really want to visit, you, you need to figure out a way to, you know, turn that off. Um, and, uh, and look, I love this that, you know, Julie went and did it, dug right into it. That's wonderful. This is, this is the thing that I really, 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 really want to emphasize. And while I say this, if you have any questions, drop them in the chat right now while we're looking. Okay. Um, and so the thing that's really important here is that as much as possible, you need to practice this stuff. It's like learning anything, okay? If you're watching me right now, that's, that's good. You know, you're taking it in. Maybe you take some notes that helps with retention. But the way for you to actually be able to apply this stuff is to do it. Um, and so you want to be able to sort of practice this while I'm going through it. Uh, Julie did a good job here dropping some stuff in, looking. Thank you very much for doing that and demoing that. Um, so we're going to move on now and just quickly take a look at um, archiving. But I also just want to encourage you, if you have questions, put them in the chat, because as I finish each little section here, I'm absolutely coming and checking the chat, just like we're doing now. And so I'm going to look and, uh, and I will definitely see it. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's, uh, let's dive back in and let's learn a little bit about archiving. Okay. Um, so archive.org is a wonderful free resource on the internet. If you haven't already used it, I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to make you aware of it now. So you can go and visit archive.org. And the thing that I've highlighted on the top here is the Wayback Machine. So the Wayback Machine is archiving um, billions and billions of web pages all the time on the internet. Uh, and so if you are interested in a website 
and maybe the website has gone offline, you could drop its URL into that search field here and see if the Wayback Machine has ever captured pages from it. So you can kind of look back in time. If you're interested in a website that's still online, one of the good things we want to do is to see what it looked like maybe a year ago, two years ago, when it first launched. There's lots of reasons why we might want to do that, but one example is sometimes, you know, just like somebody may not pay for privacy right away when they buy a domain name, people may actually uh, say, you know, who's behind a site in its early days and then only realize later, oh, maybe I should actually hide my name because we're doing, you know, X, Y, or Z, right? So looking at the archives of a website can be really helpful in terms of finding, you know, who's behind it in terms of seeing how it's evolved over time. Uh, so this is where you want to go, archive.org. You put your URL, or you can also search by keyword into that search bar, and away you go. You'll see if it's actually been archived or not. And it doesn't archive every website, um, but you may get lucky. Okay, so in terms of our friends at Maharlika News, we can see that, um, you know, from what's here, pardon me, it's been saved 71 times between March, of 20, March, 7th, March 10th of 2017. Um, and then it had been archived on January 18th of 2022. And you can see that little chart there of like the different days and times where it has been archived and things. And so that's, you know, that's really helpful. We can see how much has been archived and we can go and look at these pages if we want to. I want to show you now the beautiful magical Wayback uh, Machine plugin. Okay. So let me, let me go back to our friends at, um, at Mahalika News. Um, so this is where uh, I want to show you if you install the Wayback Machine browser plugin, where it is going to appear and how you can bring it up. Okay. So my cursor is now, you know, towards the top of my browser. And if you can see here, I've got all of these icons. So I'm a bit of a browser plugin addict. I have a bit of a habit here. Uh, I have a lot of them and we're going to look at uh, a few of these tonight. But I want to direct you to the attention of this one here. It's got a little uh, white columns and a little roof. Uh, that is the Wayback Machine plugin. Okay, so if I click on that, it pops up the menu. Uh, and this was, as I say, they just recently updated it. It is like so much better now. It's wonderful. Okay, um, and you can see here one of the options you have is to instantly save the page right now and have it saved as a screenshot. So if you are on a website, if you're on someone's Twitter account or what have you, and you're worried maybe they're going to remove it, maybe they're going to you know, take it down later, you, with this installed, you can instantly save the page into the Wayback Machine so it will be there. And if you go and you sign up for a free account at the Wayback Machine, it will actually save all of the pages that you save using this into your account so it'll be easy for you to go and retrieve them, okay? What's also cool about it is if we click on newest, we can see the most recent time that this, uh, this page has been archived or the oldest, the earliest time. So let's click on oldest. It's going to instantly open up um, the uh, Internet Archive. It's going to start to load Maharlika News. It's a little bit slow, just so you know, the website. You just sort of want to open it and chill out, let it do, it, let it do its thing. Um, but I, as, it, as that's loading, I just want to point that if you do install this, please go down to the settings wheel here. Um, you have some additional options here. This is the context menu. Um, and there's also the general menu where you can choose some things. Like, for example, if you do have an account on the Wayback Machine and you sign in, you can have make sure that all of the things you're saving get saved into your personal account there, which, which is what I do. The other one I want to recommend is in the context menu. There's an option here to check the box for Wayback Machine count. This is a really cool thing, okay? So when we're here on the Maharlika News homepage, and you can see here in the little browser plugin icon, it has the number 72. And if I open it up, it says up here, saved 72 times. So because I've checked that box, whenever I visit any web page, it's going to tell me if it's, how many times it's been saved in the Wayback Machine. So if you go to a page and there's a zero, you know no one's ever saved it and you probably should. If it's been saved 72 times like this, you know you're going to have a chance to potentially go back in time. So just a super helpful, great tool. Archive the stuff you're looking at. You never know when it's going to go away. And let's just see here. Here we go. March 10th, 2017. This is what it archived. Obviously, some of the images are broken now. But you get a sense of some of the content that was on the page. We can go back in time and see that. All right? That is super, super helpful. Um, sometimes I have been you know, looking into a website, 
and you know maybe the website goes down or i'm really interested in what it used to look like and you know i open up the wayback machine and it's been archived going back years at that point i'm just so happy and so grateful um that's the kind of thing that makes me happy that's how big of a nerd i am but maybe you will experience that joy in your life too at some point okay all right so we looked at our archive this is what the wayback machine uh extension used to look like you can see how much better it is now all right just a couple other quick archive tips before we move on and we talk a little bit about measuring social engagement uh, on a website all right so two other archiving options one of them is archive.today uh just as a tip archive.today does a better job archiving facebook than the wayback machine often does uh, so if you're having trouble getting a good save of a site try with archive.today and uh and that may work there's also cached view uh where if you're trying to find an article that's disappeared sometimes uh it's been cached by google stored by google that's on a limited time basis but this is an easy way for you to see if it's actually there uh and then there's this this kind of neat tool and i i just want to be caution about it uh it is not foolproof um but it's it's it gives you an estimate of when a website launched you know, when we do a who is search, we can see when a domain name is purchased, right? But not a lot of people buy a domain name and then launch a website that day. You know, there's often a, a time lag between the two things. And so this one tries to estimate when a website was launched, but I really want to underline that it's an estimate. It is not something that you should consider hard and clear proof. It is just a helpful kind of direction finder for you. You shouldn't write an article saying this website was launched on this date, uh, citing the service because it's it's not for certain, but it can help give you uh, zero in on perhaps the time range of when it first went online. Okay, so those are your uh, additional archive tips. Uh, just to recap what we've been through, we did a little bit of content analysis, reading a website closely, it gives us a sense of its purpose, the business, the content where it's you know stealing its content from in this case, uh, what it's trying to do. Uh, we could see that it's you know been on a Wikipedia page about fake news in the Philippines. We started to try and figure out who is behind it and who is an IP searches were apparently very helpful uh, when it came to that. And then we started to look in the archives. We can see how the site had changed over time and that it's been archived more than 70 times. And that's helpful for us. All right. So here is our first uh, little bit of an exercise slash break. So let's take a few minutes. Uh, I'm going to drop the address of this website in. So what have we covered? Remember, we did content analysis. Um, we did searching for what other people say about the site, and we did who is and IP searches and archive as well. So we actually covered a bunch of, yeah, like four or five different things. Why don't you try out one of those things on this website, VigorTimes.com? All right, so let me drop the URL into our chat. This is where you get to sort of crack your knuckles and test something out and flex your skills, all right? So what are you gonna do? Are you gonna visit it and read it and see you know, what, what they're telling you, what they're not telling you? Is everything consistent? Are there inconsistencies? Are you gonna maybe try Whoisology and domain big data and see if you can figure out information about you know, who might have bought it and when they bought it? Do you wanna you know, put it in quotes and search it online and search it in Twitter and sort of see what people say about it? So many options, so many things to think about. Um, so I'm going to give everybody a couple of minutes to do that. Uh, and, uh, and then I want to see what you come up with. So if you find anything, um, if you find anything that's of interest, please drop it in the chat and let's talk about it. You are also welcome to, um, if you are brave to unmute and talk. Um, I would love that. I know not everybody feels comfortable doing it. That's cool. Okay. So I'll give you a, just like two more minutes. Take a moment do that let me know if you find anything okay nothing in there yet don't be shy um and we are you know we're going to continue with some more stuff two two main uh, big things left to do when it comes to websites and uh and we will continue and you can apply those to bigger times later the other thing i'll just say is if you have websites that you're have always been curious about or that are already related to a story you're working on by all means as we are going through stuff, I'll use these exercises on them, on those websites. Uh, do who is searches, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Look at their archives. Um, that's a great way to apply what I'm going through right now so that it is useful to you because at the end of the day, what matters is you being able to take some of this stuff and apply it in your work 
and do some great journalism. All right, I'm gonna take one more sip and then we will dive back in. So let me take that question from Adele. Um, can, can IP addresses be faked or made to appear as though the servers were in another place altogether? Really good question, thank you for that. So um, just again, biggertimes.com. I dropped it in there, copy that URL, paste it into your web browser, and please, uh, you know, analyze the website. Maybe do a who is search on it. Uh, you know, see, see what you can do as I answer this question. Okay, so let's go back actually to our, uh, some IP info here. So again, to recap, the IP address is the location on the internet where it's sort of the physical server hosting all of the files and images for a website is, right? And we know that there can be, in some cases, thousands or even tens of thousands of websites all hosted on the same server. And so IP addresses interest us when there are very few domain names, very few websites on the same server. And, those, and, and if they all seem to be you know, owned by or registered to the same person, have you know, similar themes in their content, then that be, starts to become an interesting connection. Now, uh, is it possible that you would get an IP address and that IP address is kind of, you know, deceptive in some way? The answer is yes. Uh, and one of the reasons for that, which is not nefarious at all, is that people often, you know, pay for services to help their website load faster or to protect their website from certain kinds of attacks, one called a denial of service attack, which we don't need to describe, but there are services that are pretty widely used, pretty affordable, and often built into hosting plans uh, that, that will obscure the actual IP of a particular server. Um, one of the most popular services like this is called Cloudflare. And so if you come to a, a page and instead of you know, seeing like just a couple of sites hosted on it and the organization name is Cloudflare, for example, at that point, it's probably a dead end because Cloudflare, I don't even know how many websites it is providing its service to at this point, probably billions. Cloudflare is, is adding one of its own IP addresses in front of the actual IP address of the site. And so a good rule of thumb is that if you click on the IP address and the organization name is Cloudflare, you probably have to stop right there because that is not the true IP address of the site. It has been put uh, with a sort of Cloudflare server in front of it to help protect the site and to help it load more quickly. So that's, you know, that's the main thing I would just encourage you to be uh, aware of. And that is not nefarious. Cloudflare Flare is widely used and very popular. Uh, and it is something that will obscure the actual IP address. That being said, you get cases like this where people are not using a service like that, where the IP address does give you a very good pointer. And if you look at the who is information of, you know, the other website hosts on the IP, it ends up being, you know, potentially the exact same people. Um, so thank you for that question. It was good context to have. Uh, and I think the other thing uh, that it does is it brings us back to the point that I will keep making again and again, which is that, you know, you can't just take one piece of evidence, one digital trail and make a decision based on that. Because, you know, you may strike out with an IP address. You might strike out with who is. Um, you know, you need to find multiple points of connection, again, to get to that point of attribution. Um, so IP address is going to be helpful in some cases, completely unhelpful in others. Cherry Ann Lim. Um, so India created 112620. All right. So it looks to me, uh, I think you did a who is search there. Right. Um, and, uh, and saw that, you know, it's been registered. Uh, back in looks like 2020 uh, and there we go. Okay. Yeah. Got a little more information here. So we've got the registration in 2020 um, and we can see in the who is information. It's telling us that uh, it looks like whoever registered it is in India, right? So we, now we've got a pointer towards a country. Um, so that's helpful. And let's just see here. I forget what shows up for these. So let me just quickly go to main big data, do the search. But it's great that some people threw it in and wanted to see what was there. So what do we get? Um, you know, in this one, it's telling me 2016. And we get a name and we get, you know, a name associated with 18 domains and a specific email with eight. So what was Whoisology? Is Whoisology telling us something different? Let's see here. Whoisology. Oh, I think I also know what people are looking at. I think people, here we go. 
look at this. We have differences between the two of them. We have create a date 2020 11 26 and just India for who is algae. So this is another example here. And actually, we're getting a specific region in India too. This is another example where um, let's make sure we always use the, the you know, maximum number of services we can. So who is algae? Yeah, giving us a 2020 date. Interesting. Um, and but when it comes to domain big data, it's telling us that it looks like actually um, this person may has maybe owned this since 2016. And it looks like we could continue on from there, click on their email address and start to see what else they have. Uh huh. Potentially interesting stuff. Uh, and what's also interesting here is, uh, let's see, you know, a domain. Oh, that's the registrar. Sorry, I forget that. So um, that's interesting. Someone's email, someone's location compared with that. You know, the other thing also is like when you get information like that, it's good to contrast it. So there's an about us page. If we go to the about us page, um, what does it tell us? It says founded in 2020 by M.M. Khan. Okay. And it's signed here, M.M. Khan. Okay, great. Now, what was the name that we saw in Domain Big Data? It's not M.M. Khan. Um, you know, and so it's possible, look, they bought the domain name in 2016, didn't launch until 2020. That's possible, right? But we've got one name here and we've got one name here. So if we were really trying to dig into the site, we would want to figure out, um, are these guys partners? Uh, has it changed hands over time? Why do we have two different names? Is MM Con real, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So you can see how very quickly you can find avenues that you want to dig into a bit more. All right, here we go. Let's continue on analyzing engagement, audience, and connections, okay? So by engagement, we're talking about social engagement. And we're going to choose actually a different site here from the Philippines that is of interest to us for this one. It's got a little more social engagement than Maraluca News. Uh, we're going to be looking at the dailycentry.net. And we're going to use two tools here, uh, both of which are free. Okay, first is a, a website called BuzzSumo. Uh, BuzzSumo has a free uh, level, but just be aware, um, this is the one that I might say you don't actually necessarily need to test it right now because you only get like a couple of free lookups a month. They're very stingy. Uh, so you can chill on this one if you want, but it's just good to like open the site and look at it if you, if you want to. Um, and then the second one is the CrowdTangle browser extension. So if you haven't already installed that, why don't you try and do it now before we get to it? Because it is super duper 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 helpful, okay? So similarly to what we did with Maharlika News, I wanna do this live, but I wanna emphasize that I have the step-by-step -step instructions in the slides for you okay so let's check out uh why don't we first visit the dailycentry.net so this is the site maybe you're familiar with it maybe not um you know so they're publishing a lot of like viral news looks like to me right um and so we but we want to go to bus sumo so the the place we want to go is app.buzzsumo.com slash content okay um, and I'm actually, uh, I have an account, so I'm just going to log in, but you can absolutely get results with a, a free, oops, with a free account. We want to go to content. There we go. Um, all right. So here we are. We can drop in a domain name. So let me tell you what BuzzSumo does. BuzzSumo will take a domain name that you drop in and it will tell you the most popular content on across social media for that domain name. Okay, so it looks at the domain, it looks at all of the URLs on the domain that it can find, and it looks at the social engagement for all of those URLs and quickly tells you, hey, here is the most popular stuff on the Daily Century. So why don't we do that? Um, now, because I'm, I'm signed in with an account, it's showing me results of the most popular stuff from the past year. When you sign in with your, when you go there with a free account, it's gonna give you the past six months. So you will have some limited results compared to what we see here but it will actually give you the top most engaged content. We, what we can see here very quickly is like, okay, so in the past year, like they've had some good hits on Facebook, right? And what's also interesting is like, it is Facebook and only Facebook. They don't seem to care about Twitter, Pinterest, Reddit, not shocking, but like it, it's a stark thing here. And so we can see here what their most popular content is, and we could look at the headlines and we could see themes related to that. And now we start to understand, okay, what is this website publishing and what of what it is publishing is the most popular, okay? 
So that's why BuzzSumo is helpful. It gives us this great look at what is the most engaged content on a particular domain. So let's take one of these as an example because this gives us that broad view of here's all of the sort of popular most engaged content. But let's open this one up. So here is, you know, the top performing one on Facebook in the last year. Um, you know, we can see here this. Now this is where we're going to use our CrowdTangle browser plugin. So here's the difference between BuzzSumo and the CrowdTangle plugin. BuzzSumo, if we just look at it again, gives us the report across the whole website, okay? But all it's doing is giving us the total engagement number. We don't really understand why this particular article managed to get that much engagement. You know, what were the pages and groups and people who shared it that helped it get so much engagement? And that is the way we can get more specific. If we want the engagement for one particular URL, in this case, one story, this is where we use the CrowdTangle browser plugin. All right, so if you look on my, my big list of extensions here, remember our friends at the uh, Wayback Machine plugin? Um, so now we're looking at the one that's just the letter C and T, that stands for CrowdTangle. Uh, and if I click on that, it opens it up and look at what we get here. This is giving us a breakdown of the public Facebook pages and the public Facebook groups. And I'm stressing the word public because it will not show you shares in private Facebook groups. It will not show you shares from average people posting it to their profile. It is only going to show you a selection of public pages, public groups, where this link has been posted. And in this case, they're identifying 69 times that it's been posted, generating 573,000 interactions. So, you know, the vast majority of the total interactions it got is, is being represented by the 69 postings it's showing here. So that's good. That's, it's giving us a lot of good info. And now surprisingly, we can see here that obviously they posted it multiple times to their page and it did extremely well. Uh, you know, pretty much every time they post it. But what's also interesting is, well, who else posted it? And like, here's, I think this maybe is a group. Here's a group with about 40,000 members, or maybe it's a page, we'll find out in a moment. And it posted it twice. Okay, that's interesting. And look, they post the heck out of their content. Oh, there's this one again. We saw this one before, we see it again. Oh, we see a whole bunch of, of these ones sharing it here. So now what we're able to see is that, you know, there's this particular entity here, a group or a page, that has posted this link almost as many times as the official Facebook page of it itself. And that's the kind of thing that stands out to me. I'm sort of wondering, okay, so does this page or group have a relationship to the website? Is there a reason why they would post it so many times? Because like usually somebody wouldn't do that, you know, without decent reason. So is this a case where it's just the same people in a group posting it all the time? Or is it a page choosing to post the same article multiple times? So we'll open this up, we click on it, and this is a page, right? Okay, so that's interesting. Now, why would this page post that content all the time? And so what I would like to do is, you know, I'm, I'm gonna open up the page for real, and I'm like, huh, do they post daily century content all the time as a pattern? And as we scroll through it, we see that, yep, every link that we are seeing posted by this page goes to the dailycentury.net. Every single one of them as I am scrolling through. And so now that raises the question, what is the relationship between the positive page and the dailycentury.net? Um, do they declare any kind of relationship or not? Uh, and so this is something that, you know, we really want to understand better. And, you know, one of the things that we would want to do is maybe go to the about page of this. And we can see there's a Gmail address. So that's good. We can, you know, we can grab that. We can see there's some, you know, some reviews, and we would want to learn more about this page, wouldn't we, to understand why the positive page chooses to post everything from the dailycentry.net. Chances are they have a financial relationship or they're both run by the same people, right? Okay, so that is an example of how the CrowdTangle browser plugin, by giving us results, can point us in interesting directions. We can start to get a sense of how is the content of this particular website being shared, and does this website potentially have relationships with multiple Facebook pages? Um, the CrowdTangle browser plugin, just so you know, also gives data from Twitter, but only from the past seven days, okay? Uh, this is a tool actually built by Facebook, and so you only get Twitter data for seven days. It will also show you if a link has been posted to Reddit. You're gonna come up empty here, yeah, probably. And also Instagram, okay? 
So that is a great tool for you. And you can, by the way, you can also download the data um, to look at it a little more closely. It downloads it as a CSV file, okay? So that's how we can quickly look at the overall engagement for a site using BuzzSumo and then drill down more specifically using the CrowdTangle browser plugin on a specific article. And interesting relationships can potentially be revealed from that, okay? Uh, and again, if that went by too fast and you're worried you didn't get it, I walk you through some of the stuff that we are looking at here, okay? And you can see, again, you know, think about the pages of groups with multiple posts. Why would they be sharing that content repeatedly? Is there a relationship? Those are the kinds of questions, and that is the mindset, remember, we want to have. All right, so last uh, sort of piece here a little bit on audience before we get into that uh, fantastic trick for uh, connecting things together. Uh, there is a website called SimilarWeb. It is it has a very good free version. Uh, if you'll notice, that's the theme. I, I do workshops with tools that at, at the very least have a free version because uh, you know not everybody can pay for the same tools. So what is free? And in this case, SimilarWeb, which is a really powerful tool for measuring, you know, how many people visit a website or an app, where do they come from, how long do they stay on it, all that kind of stuff. A uh, SimilarWeb is really helpful for that. Uh, and so in this case, you know, what it's telling us is that the Daily Century, uh, you know, you can see here, it's getting almost 800,000 visits per month on average. Uh, it's gonna show us data for the last few months. Uh, it's telling us that people visit 2.25 pages per visit and they stay on the site for almost a minute. Um, and then it gives you some rankings and some other things. And here's some of the other information that can be really helpful. Uh, and we're gonna actually use similar web again later for the ads example. Uh, but let's just quickly go through here. So it's telling us, um, you know, the amount of visits it got the past three months, uh, October, November, and December in this case. So, you know, it's had a low month in October, did great in November, uh, almost as good in December. So it's, you can see that information right away. Um, it's also telling us where does the audience come from? Where does it get its traffic? And this breakdown is really helpful because this actually kind of dovetails nicely with what we got from BuzzSumo. But Sumo was telling us it gets a ton of engagement from Facebook and seemingly only Facebook. And in this case, it's telling us that, yeah, it's traffic pretty much only comes from Facebook. So this is a website that lives and dies by Facebook, which may explain why there are multiple pages sharing its content. Uh, it is trying to get its content out there as much as possible. Okay, so it's telling us uh, that. And then, you know, the other main one here, it says is direct. If you see that on the left-hand side, we're going to come back and we're gonna talk more about direct in the ad section. Um, but the direct one is the one that you have to uh, look at with the most sort of caution because direct is supposed to refer to people who are actually like typing in, you know, uh, in this case, the dailycentry.net in their web browser and going there directly, or maybe they bookmarked it. Uh, and so that's usually, if, if a website has high direct traffic, that usually means it's got, you know, a well-established and loyal audience. That's a, that's a good thing for them. Um, but sometimes the direct uh, calculation can be a little bit off, and that's just a little bit of a hint of where we're going to go when we look in the ad section in a bit. But for right now, we can see here the data seems to make sense. They get a ton of Facebook engagement. They're pretty much getting all their traffic from Facebook. Uh, and that is bored out here when it when it breaks down the social media traffic even more and it tells us, yeah, it's pretty much all coming from Facebook and a tiny bit from Facebook Messenger, getting nothing from Twitter or other places. Okay, let me quickly check the chat. Does anybody have any questions? Because we're moving into our last section here of investigating websites. Um, and, oh, you can see the cat? Hello. Okay, I'm, I'm glad you got to see her. Yeah, she came. She sat on my lap. Very nice. Um, now she's back there. And she has not attacked me. So we are all doing really well. Good girl. Oh, she's being, she's being very sweet right now. She's always a sweet cat. But you know, sometimes cats, they're just like, okay, I'm done with you. And then, and then that's, that's how it is. Um, and it looks like we've got some other stuff from Bigger Times. Uh, oldest post from October of 2016 using Wayback Machine. Good job using the Wayback Machine, Tom. I love it. Uh, Julie points out, very good. They are stolen posts. Echoes of Mahalika News. Post that went viral. Um, oh, sorry, you're talking about um, Daily Century. Thank you. Um, these are stolen posts. They went viral and they packaged it like their own article. And so Julie gives us a link here. I like it. Um, and so here we go. She found, you know, the Jack Manalo is is has an author account on 
the Daily Century, and we can see they've got two sites that they're listing, the Daily Century, another one called News Keener. Okay, um, and so what is News Keener? This is a connection between the Daily Century and News Keener. And so Julie has done a wonderful thing here where she has you know, identified that they're stealing repackaging content. She identified an author profile, which then leads us to another website, which, what can we do? Well, why don't we just pick the, the most recent article here, and why don't we do our CrowdTangle look at it again? Now, is it being shared by similar pages as Daily Century? Yeah, look at that. The Daily Century and Positive, right off the top, um, have shared it. I think that Vic Soto one um, had also shared. And thinking uh, PH and uh, Pinoy Caloco, I'm pretty sure those had also been sharing Daily Century. So we've got the makings of a, a mapping on a network here, don't we? We've got two websites. We've got a bunch of Facebook pages. We've got you know viral stuff being repackaged, and we can start to build that out if we want to. Now, granted, maybe you all know all that. Daily Century is famous and notorious, and and I'm just you know some guy in Canada who doesn't know anything. Uh, but that is an example of how you start to build it. So thank you, Julie. Uh, that was super helpful for a real time demo of how we can just like start moving, right? We start moving from one thing that we have and we find stuff and you can see I get excited by this. Um, and hopefully, you know, you'll have that experience too where you start to make connections and follow trails and things start to get put together. All right, so let's just, let's give Rosie another shout out here. Let's just go, she's looking, look, she's like looking up at all you guys. Okay, she's like, what are you doing? Okay, all right, let's take it home here for our first section on websites. Uh, and then we're going to have a little quick break and we'll talk about ads. All right, so here's the deal. We're going to talk about two free and very popular services. One is called Google AdSense. One is called Google Analytics, okay? They're both made by a company named Google. Maybe you've heard of them. Uh, so let's talk about Google Analytics first. Uh, when you have a website, you want to know how many people are visiting your website, where they came from, all those sort of statistics we kind of saw with similar web. And Google Analytics is a free piece of software that will do that for you. It is used by, gosh, I don't know, hundreds of millions, tens of millions of websites because it's super easy to install and it's free to use. And it will tell you how many people are visiting your website, where they came from, all that good stuff. Okay. The other uh, product here is Google AdSense. So let's say I have a website. Uh, Google Analytics tells me that, hey, my audience is really growing. I've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of people coming every day. I should really figure out a way to make money. Well, Google AdSense is a program that publishers, people with websites or apps can sign up to. And when you sign up and you apply to be uh, included and you are accepted, then you can have ads appear on your website and Google will pay you a percentage of the revenue from those ads. So Google AdSense is a hugely popular and lucrative way to get ads on your website. And it's super easy. This, it's super easy for both of these. If you install Google Analytics and you install Google AdSense, then what's gonna happen is you are gonna have a unique account with each of these services, and there is gonna be a unique tag assigned to your account, which is basically just like a unique ID, and we're gonna look for those IDs in a second. And if you are using Google AdSense, and if you are using Google Analytics, your tag, that unique ID will be on every page of your website, okay? So you use these services, they're free, they help you know who's visiting your website, they help you earn money, and when you use them, you, you have basically a unique identifier in every page on your website that, that smart, sneaky people like us can look for and start to connect sites together. And the reason that we can connect sites together is, you know, let's say I have five websites. Do I really want to sign up for five different Google AdSense and five different Google Analytics accounts? No. I, if, I, if I use the same account for all of them, I can look at all of them. I can have all of the money from all five sites come into the same account. I can look at the uh, traffic uh, and for all of these five sites by signing into the same account. So it is convenient to do that, and a lot of people do it. And when they do it, we can connect their websites to each other. Okay. So... Um, I'm going to do this as a live demo. I'm going to walk you through it. But I, I, as I've been saying all the way through, I have a step-by-step -step instruction for you here in the slides. So when you come back and you look at these slides, you know, in a few days or what have you, 
and, and you're like, gosh, man, that AdSense thing was really cool, but I don't remember all the steps. Don't worry about it because it's here and it's step by step and I'm gonna show you it right now. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna learn how to look at a page's source code. It's not technical, don't worry. We'll look at a page's source code. We will search on that page for the unique identifiers associated with Google Analytics and Google AdSense tags. So um, when it comes to Google Analytics, every single unique tag starts with UA dash. When it comes to AdSense, every single AdSense tag starts with PUB dash. And if we can do a search in the page's source code to see if there is a UA dash and a pub dash, if we find one or both of those, then boom, ah, there's probably a Google Analytics and a Google AdSense tag here, okay? And then what we can do is we can find that tag and we can use uh, three services, builtwith.com, spyonweb.com, and dnslytics.com to see which other websites are using the same tag, okay? And that will enable us to connect websites together. If it sounds confusing, I'm gonna show you how it works. Uh, I also wanna note that when a site is archived, the Wayback Machine archives its source code. And that means, and I'll show you this, we can actually go and look at an archived website and potentially identify if it has a Google AdSense and or a Google uh, AdSense tag. That's pretty cool. All right, so if you're confused right now, don't worry, because we're gonna dive in, we're gonna do this, I'm gonna show you, and it's step-by-step -step in the slides as well. All right, so I'm gonna do this live for the dailycentury.net. Okay. So remember, the first thing we want to do is we want to view the source code of a page. Why don't we open up an article on the dailycentury.net? Okay, let's do that. Here is the article, uh, a wonderfully repackaged viral hit, right? So here's, I'm on a, a Mac uh, using Chrome. And so I'm able to actually go up to um, the view and developer and hit view source. And that will open up a new tab, which has the source code for that page, you know? So like when we're visiting this page, um, the web browser is showing us this in a nice visual way, but what's actually behind under the hood is all of this code, okay? We don't need to know that, but we don't need to know how it works, but we need to know it's there. Here's another way, if you're on a PC and you wanna view the source code, just go to like a blank part of the page like this, right click with your mouse, and you should see an option here in Chrome, view page source, okay? If you click that, same thing happens. We open up our tab. So two options, view, developer, view source, and that's gonna open it, or find a blank part of the page, right click, view page source. And here we are in our source code for this particular page. And second thing we wanna do is we wanna see if there is UA dash and or pub dash to tell us if there is an analytics tag or an AdSense tag. Um, so two ways to do this again, don't worry, it's, it's all in the slides. Uh, so we can go up to edit and find and find, okay? So edit, find, and this gives us this nice little uh, search bar here. Remember, we were going to look for UA dash. We just type that in. Look what we get. We've got UA dash 112340706-1. There is, that is what a Google Analytics tag looks like, okay? So this site uses Google Analytics. That is its unique tag we could sort of copy that down right now. Second thing we wanted to look for was for Google AdSense. That's uh, pub dash, that's short for publisher. And we get a hit as well. Uh, pub dash 1556 and on and on and on. Voila, here is a Google AdSense tag. So we opened up the source code. We did a simple find on the page. In this case, remember the first one I did was edit, find, and find. There's a shortcut on Mac, it also works on PC. On Mac, it's just, you know, the command button and F, so let me close this. If I hit command F, look what happens, it pops up again. Um, but I can close that. Uh, and on a PC, it is control F. So if you have the source code page open and you hit control F, the find will be there. You can type in pub dash and it will instantly find this. And that's the shortcut rather than, than scrolling through the whole page, okay? So why don't we continue with our publisher tag here, our Google AdSense publisher tag. So I'm copying that, I'm pasting it. I, I mentioned to you um, there were a couple of different services. So one of them is Spy on Web, and I'll just open up the other one. Um, DNS Lytics, that's the one I want. Uh, all right, so let's go to Spy on Web. So this is a service where I can actually drop in the pub 
or I could do that with the UA, the analytics uh, ID. Drop this in, hit go, and here's what we've got. Well, it's telling us that it has apparently seen potentially, you know, 42 domains with this same Google AdSense ID. So that's like a, a large number here. Now, one of the cautions that I will put on this is that a lot of these are .blogspot.com. Um, and so it's possible that these are connected, but it's also possible that, that some of these are false results. And so I, in this scenario, would put more interest and more emphasis on, uh, on the ones that are not Blogspot blogs, okay? Let me just quickly double check something here. Uh -huh. Oh, not good, okay. So that is our option there. That's a lot of domains. What does DNS Lytics tell us? So we, we go to DNS Lytics, we go up here to reverse tools. We want reverse AdSense, right? And we can drop in the AdSense ID. We hit enter. It's working. It's working. Uh, and let's see what it tells us when it finally finishes searching. Um, and so what we want to do, you know, similarly with the who has searches, we don't want to just search one, right? Uh, and so in this case, it's showing us a whole bunch of other IDs. You know what's interesting here? I actually feel like, sorry, I want to see, here's the thing. This is what I should have been careful about. So it's actually telling us that there are, if you see here, it says one of eight results. Okay. So we get a first one here, but there's a second one and a third one, and they start to become different. And here's why we were getting some weird results there so the first id is one that is giving us all these blogspot results and giving us over 1.7 million domains using that clearly this is an, an id that is a shared one across many sites that is not the result we want so i'm going to use the second pub id that we see in the source code on the site and now we're getting only three domains with it Thank you. Okay, so we've got a Tumblr, a Blogspot, and Mobile Photography PH. So this is where the lesson is, if you see multiple pub IDs, you're gonna need to run them all. And if you see a pub ID that has tons and tons of sites, it's kind of like the equivalent of an IP address where there are you know, dozens and dozens or thousands of websites on the same IP. Um, you are looking for one with a lower number of related websites. And in this case, we kept looking for a different publisher ID. We found it. And now look at this, only three related websites. And if we rerun our search here, let's see what they tell us. So we've got, what have we got? The results we get to see for free are, there's four of them, Daily Century, TFN Press, not just Food PH, and NewSpy.net. And then if we look at what Spy and Web told us, we get three completely different ones, right? And so now, our total is seven domains, including the dailycentry.net that are possibly related, okay? And how do we start, sort of con, you know, start to confirm whether they actually are related? Well, this is where everything we have already done to get to this point, we would simply redo. So let's say we were interested in mobile photography PH. What would we do? Well, we might visit it for content analysis. We might do a who is search. We might look in the archive of it. And then we might also visit it and see if, it, if we can see the actual same Google publisher ID in the source code. And that's how we start to do our verification and confirmation work. We can't just write an article saying like, well, Spy on Web says it has the same publisher ID. And DNS Lytics say these ones have the same publisher ID. You have to go and do your confirmation of them by rerunning the process that we've been going through the whole time. So that may seem tedious, but that is how you do careful, good quality work. So let's, let's take a look at mobile photography PH. So I click on it. Oh, sorry, I wanna visit the site. Let me grab the domain name here. All right, oh, interesting. So it's telling us um, that mobile photography PH uh, is, is not an active website, but of course we have our friends at the Wayback Machine, don't we? Uh, and it's telling us that this site has been saved seven times. So Let's click here for view archived version. And we've gone from a site that is no longer online to one that can still be useful to us because we have this browser plugin installed. Isn't that great? That's why it's uh, super fast and easy to have. So we can see here that 
you know, it's got different captures at different times. At this point, it was for sale. Why don't we take the more recent capture here and click on that? Um, and let's see if we can get a result here when this website was actually online um, and helpful to us. All right, it's pulling up another result. What do we got here? So this is February 2nd of 2016. Um, and here we are getting a result when the site was actually online. So you can see at a certain point it gets taken offline, the domain is for sale, but we can still see a bit of what the website used to look like. Now, what is it we were interested in? Do you remember? It was the publisher ID because uh, our friends at Spy on Web, let's go back to it, told us that mobilephotographyph.com at some point in time had this same pub ID in it. So why don't we copy that pub ID I remember I told you that even archived pages can do source code and searches in. So let's do right click, view page source. Let's do control F. Let's paste in that pub ID and boom, we get a hit. So in 2016, at least we know in February 2nd of 2016, mobile photography PH absolutely had the same AdSense tag as is currently present on the dailycentury.net. Now, all we know is that that's the case. We would have to start figuring out what is the connection between mobilephotographyph.com and the dailycentury.net. Um, is there an about page here on these archived things? You know, can we do a who is search of who owned it at that time? Does that connect us to you know the author page and names that we see on the Daily Century? You can understand now how you know knowing how to do these processes, knowing how to run these searches we are suddenly empowered as we find more websites and we find more connections to kind of rerun the same process, rerun the same mindset and start to figure out the connections and understand. Um, but the, you know, one of the important takeaways here is we don't just accept what these sites are taking us, telling us we go and we do our manual confirmation, which is why I showed you how to search on a site. Um, and if you remember, there was one other site that I suggested we could sort of do a search of the Daily Century on for its um, connections. And that was built with. I'm going to show it last because with built with, it actually doesn't require you to uh, to go and find the publisher ID. But the reason you need to show it is what I just showed you is that you have to do manual confirmation. But let's throw the dailycentury.net and builtwith.com as our final thing, and let's see what we get here. So built with is kind of cool because it tells us all the technology being used in a website. All of these are all the different tools and plugins here. Not super useful for us. What we're really interested in right now is the relationship profile, okay? So relationship profile tells us the other websites with the same tags that may be connected. And this is a really user-friendly way. But I show it to you last because I really want you to do the manual way of finding this stuff in the source code and testing it on Spy on Web and testing it on DNS Lytics because you should ideally run all three of these on any website you're interested in. Um, and this one is the most user-friendly because you can see here, so there's the Google Analytics tag. It's, it's saying it doesn't connect that to any websites. Here's another uh, tag for a service called uh, Add This. And we can see here that it's connecting it to a bunch of other sites. So these sites may also be connected to uh, the dailycentury.net. Um, we can here is our trusty Google AdSense tag. And we can see here uh, TFN Press showing up, not just Food PH showing up. Those are sort of familiar but also some other websites. Um, and we can even see a listing here over time of when these websites had these different tags. Really nice, really user-friendly, nicely visual, uh, but you still are gonna have to go and confirm whether or not these websites still have these tags on it, because if it's in the past, the relationship may not be as clear and as useful to you, okay? Now, I realize that's a lot to throw at you, but I wanna remind you again that the step-by-step -step process of finding the source, searching the source, and being able to then run the searches for this pub ID, it's all here for you, okay? It's all here for you to be able to do, including finding that publisher ID in an archive page, and then taking it to built with and looking at those, okay? So this is something you're gonna wanna review because I realize it's not a sort of natural process that you would think of on your own, but if this is something you know how to do and something you practice, you will find this incredibly helpful as you start to connect websites together. Because let's, I mean, let's think about this. We've got an election coming up. It's very easy for candidates and people who are arm's length supporting candidates to throw up new websites uh, to attack opponents or to support their candidate. 
And you're going to want to figure out if you can actually connect those websites back to a campaign, back to a candidate, that kind of thing. And so everything I've showed you today will hopefully equip you to be able to dig into stuff and figure out the origins and the motivations and the engagement and the traction that different websites are getting. All right. So that's a, this is a recap of, you know, us looking at BuzzSumo CrowdTangle, us using similar web, and then us digging in on those AdSense and analytics tags. And again, using the Wayback Machine, super useful tool. Okay. So if you want, okay, we're going to take uh, about a five minute break here. You could go right now and, and go to bigger times and practice getting its source code up and identifying a publisher ID or an analytics ID. That would be a great way to apply the knowledge that we've just gone through. Uh, it's your choice if you want to do that. I'm also just quickly going to check here um, in the chat because if you need your break, take your break now. We are going to start ads soon. And I'm going to, uh, we're going to dig in here. Okay. So um are we in session two now we're starting session two in about five minutes um and uh so yeah and that'll be i'm gonna start it uh actually maria let me know if i should actually wait until 10 45. um if there are new people coming in then who won't actually be ready in five minutes otherwise i can start you know a little bit before uh 10 45. And so just let me know about that if you want in the chat or you can uh, let me know now. Yeah. So uh, Enrico has been using CrowdTangle and encountered a couple scenarios. So there's no data shown or it shows a result, but the result is actually for another article. Um, so I definitely have had cases where there's no data shown. Um, the showing data, but it's actually for another article is, is something I can't recall encountering. And by the way, yes, I do want you to uh, if you're listening to me answer these questions, I would love it if you went to the to bigger times and practiced identifying, even if you're not going to do the searches of where else they are, just practice identifying the source code of bigger times and, and finding the UA and pub IDs. If you just do that alone, that'll be great. So why, why does CrowdTangle give you some problems at times? You know, this is such a simple and maybe unsatisfying answer, but, um, you know, the deal is that, uh, it's, it's a tool, it has people working on it, and there are absolutely bugs at times. Um, and so at times, you know, the data source that connects to the Facebook servers and all that into the CrowdTangle plugin, sometimes that's not working well. And I'll tell you another reason why you may be encountering this issue recently and why, unfortunately, it may actually get worse, which is that, you know, CrowdTangle was acquired by Facebook several years ago, and Facebook... CrowdTangle is a tool that provides a lot of transparency to Facebook, and that has become a bit of a concern for Facebook. And so the CrowdTangle team has been reorganized. The engineers that were working on CrowdTangle have uh, been either completely reassigned or just reduced overall. And so unfortunately, CrowdTangle is not being supported the way it was a year or two ago. Uh, and so if you are encountering issues with CrowdTangle, Part of it may be that it's just not getting the attention and love and resources that it once had. Um, so that may be the source of that. All right. So Michael has asked, what if you searched a website on the Wayback Machine and it says this URL, this URL has been excluded from the Wayback Machine? All right, man. Great question. All right. So um, this absolutely happens. There are times where, you know, you go to the Wayback Machine. I don't have one of these off the top of my head, but just to remind you, we go to the Wayback Machine, we enter in our URL. And you get that result, which tells you this, this site has been excluded from the Wayback Machine. Um, every website is a, it can have a file called um, robots.txt. I wonder if Bigger Times has one. Let's see. So you know how there are sort of automated crawlers? Here we go. There are automated crawlers. Like for Google to be able to give you results, it has to go and scan and crawl websites and see what content is there. And there is a file that websites can put called robots.txt, and it's whatever the domain is, slash robots.txt, where they can actually give instructions for the search engine's crawlers, the search engine's bots, the robots that are scanning websites, and say, hey, I don't want you to scan these pages, or I don't want you to see this. And this, this is an instruction that you know, the robots scanning the page have to see. And a website can actually, in its robots.txt, say, I do not allow the Internet Archive to index this site. So the reason you get that result most of the time is because the website has decided to exclude itself 
in its robots.txt file. So you would see, um, you know, information here related to archive.org. Uh, and, you know, for me, there can be some legitimate reasons why a site would do that. But in my experience, it's often sites that don't want people kind of, you know, calling it on things. Uh, that it's sites that don't want people to archive perhaps the, you know, extreme or false content that it is uh, publishing. It gives them an opportunity to erase the record and prevent its stuff from being archived there. And so, you know, the short answer of that is the, the website itself, the people writing the website, has, have made a conscious decision to exclude and prevent archive.org from being able to archive the site. Now, I want to remind you, I, in our archiving section, which I'll just go back to really quickly, I, I told you about a couple other services, right? So if you are trying to archive a site and it, and it won't uh, allow archive.org to do it, try archiving it with archive.today. If you are trying to look for older uh, pages from a particular website, look for it and see if it is present in archive.today or if that particular page is, is present in cacheview.com. All right, and just to show you what archive.today looks like, if I wanted to archive the Daily Century, I would paste it in here and hit save. But if I wanted to see all of the snapshots that Archive Today has about the Daily Century, I would put it down here and hit search. And this would tell me, in this case, no, nope, no results. Um, but you sometimes get lucky. All right, so I hope that answers that question. Um, Jasper has asked, is there a way to estimate the revenue of a website um, using the UA or pub IDs? Uh, no. There isn't a way to, to estimate the revenue of a website using those. However, if you recall, when we were looking at the uh, similar web free report, similar web for some websites will actually give you a revenue estimate. So if you see that over here in the little box, um, you know, they're estimating data, you know, number of employees, where it's based, the category, and they're estimating revenue of one to five million dollars. I gotta tell you, I don't know where they're pulling that information from. Okay, so I personally would only ever report that data if I reached out to SimilarWeb and asked them to tell me where that is coming from, and then if it seemed like you know good and reliable data. It is kind of hard to do a good calculation, but SimilarWeb provides one of the essential things you need in order to do a proper calculation, which is you know how much traffic and how many page views does a site have, and if you know you know how many how many people are visiting and how many you know, pages they're loading, then you have to calculate how many ads are per page and the average price of those ads, and then you can start to get to an estimate. But I gotta tell you, it's a pretty inexact science. Um, and the best way to actually estimate revenue for a particular operation is to develop sources inside the organization and see if they have access to their actual you know, Google AdSense console or what have you, and they can give you data from there. But similar way it gives you an estimate, and it's worth following up and asking similar web where that comes from if you actually want to cite it in an article. Um, and just to follow up with Michael, um, you know, yes, it, if you are seeing that a site has been excluded from archive.org, in most cases, it is a decision by the website's owners and or programmer to exclude it from being able to be archived in the Wayback Machine. Um, and you may consider that a bit of a red flag or not. You know, that's another piece of information and piece of data um, that you can throw into your analysis of what you're doing, right? Okay, so uh, are there any other questions? You can drop them in the chat or you can unmute. Um, I also wanna say, you know, if anyone found, was able to connect bigger times to other websites and wants to share that, I'm all for it. But if I can emphasize one thing from all of this that you should try to practice, you've got the whole day ahead of you, is try to do the view source just pick any website view source do the find within it for ua do the find in it for pub dash um, because that's the one where you have to remember a few steps whereas in other cases it's like plugging the url in and it's a little more straightforward um, so if you practice that if you schedule again something 30 minutes for yourself in your calendar in the next week to just flip through my slides that would be great um, and, and a really good way for you to be able to retain this knowledge. Honestly, the CrowdTangle browser plugin was super duper helpful for me because 
you know, I wanted to understand if it was a website that was unfamiliar, I wanted to get a sense of like, okay, do they have Facebook page? What kind of engagement are they getting? So I always found that really helpful when there was like a new news website that came out of nowhere, maybe it was, you know, spreading really hyperpartisan stuff or some misleading stuff. I wanted to understand, you know, what kind of engagement they were getting. Uh, are they getting traction? Where is their audience coming from? So the CrowdTanger browser plugin, super, super helpful for that. I would say a second thing, um, you know, that, and, and a red flag there is, is a lot of times what would happen is a new website would spring up out of nowhere, but it would be getting shared by huge established Facebook pages. And what, what we sort of started to realize was that people, you know, it didn't actually matter what the website domain was they would just kind of create an entirely new website, put new content on it. But as long as they had a big Facebook page, they could drive the audience to it. Cause like you saw with the daily century, they could literally just create a new website tomorrow. And as long as they were sending people to it from their Facebook page, they, that website would do fine because the website is all about the Facebook page. The Facebook page is the engine. And so that was the thing for me. It was like, I would see new news websites popping up all the time but they would get promoted by the same network of Facebook pages because people realize if they launch new domains, then those new domains might not get blocked. They might not get suppressed by Facebook because they were brand new. They didn't have a reputation. So that was sort of like a red flag is brand new website, uh, hyper partisan content, but being promoted by the exact, you know, a network of established pages. That was an indicator that, oh, they're just like hopping from domain, domain, domain to make sure that their domains don't get blocked and that kind of thing. All right, so Samuel, how do you integrate the tools uh, when you're writing a story? Uh, are these tools considered reliable sources or will you have to counter check it with other official sources? All right, good question. So um, look, I mean, when I'm doing a story and there are websites involved, I mean, th these set of tools and approaches are really, really core to that. Because I always want to know, you know, who's behind a website? What kind of engagement is it getting? Um, is there a network of, you know, supportive Facebook pages or other things uh, promoting it? What is the relationship between them? And so that stuff is really, really essential to me. Um, but your second question is also really essential, which is, are, they, are these tools considered reliable sources or do you have to counter check it with other official sources? So this goes back to a key point that I made early on, which is, you know, any one signal is, is not enough to sort of write a story off that, right? And so if you think about it, what are the things that we looked at? Well, we looked at domain ownership records. We looked at, you know, social engagement patterns in particular pages connected. We looked at connecting websites together via, um, you know, tags. And so what I would say is, you know, usually just one of those signals, probably not enough, unless like it's a domain registration and it's a person's name and then you call them up and they say like, yeah, that's my website. Well, there you go. Right. So you always are going to need to go to the person and ask them, is this your website? And I'm asking you because I have all of these indicators that this is your website. So in that case, when they confirm it, sure, that's enough. But, but to write an article and say, you know, this website is absolutely owned by this person or this group because, you know, they have a, a, a Google Analytics ID and it's connected to this other website, which is owned by that group, that on its own wouldn't be enough. And so for me, I think about how many of these individual things can I stack on top of each other to the point where, you know, the most logical or perhaps only explanation is that there is a strong connection between this person or this entity because they're in the who is, because the AdSense ID is connected to a website that they're also in the who is, you know, because the archived version of the website from three years ago listed their company name on it, right? So you want to think about how many of those you have. And like a lot of things in newsrooms, it, it may come down to a judgment call. Do you feel absolutely confident that the only explanation is this website is connected to this person or entity? Can there be other explanations? What do they say when you contact them? Um, what do their employees or current or former business partners say? So ideally, Samuel, you want to combine the digital trail and evidence with as many of those as possible with also, yes, going to the people, talking to sources, um, asking officials, all of that. Always try to combine the two. That is actually how you can get to that place of attribution and certainty and not leave people the wiggle room to kind of get out of it. All right, so thank you very much. We'll see you soon.